Hello, Sean and Ashlyn with a Vectorworks tutorial on a topic that, looking back over my videos, I realized I've never actually talked about image props on their own. And it's a question I get asked a lot, both by my students and by people online, saying, you know, how did you get that person in your image? And I've been forwarding them a, a pretty good tutorial that's part of the Renderworks series over on the Vectorworks channel, and I'll put a link to that in the description because it is good. Um, but I also use image props in a lot of other ways. I kind of hack image props to get a lot of mileage out of them. They're really terrific for adding lots of life and detail to your models without adding a lot of extra geometry. Now the obvious thing to use them for, of course, are things like people or plants that uh, you will want to add to a rendering to give it a lot of life, uh, but you, you can't possibly create this ivy clump here with actual geometry. Each one of these little leaves and stems and little extrude along a paths and things. I mean, it would, be, it would be just massive. You could do that. You could make a model of ivy, but that would be bigger than your building that you were putting it on. So we use image props as a way to add that life without adding a lot of extra geometry. So if you're not familiar with the term, what it actually is, is if you've ever walked into a movie theater or if you're old enough to know what a video store is and there's a, a Darth Vader standing there in the lobby and you, at first glance you think, oh, there's somebody standing there in a Darth Vader costume, but then you realize, oh no, it's just a cardboard cutout with a photograph laminated to it. It's life size and it's cut out, the silhouette of it is cut out, but you realize really quickly as you move that it's not actually somebody in a costume standing there, it's just just a photograph cutout. So now our little person here is doing kind of the same thing, except she has the auto rotate to viewer function snapped on. And I'll explain more about that in a minute so that she's always facing the camera as we move around, uh, almost like there was somebody standing behind the cardboard Darth Vader, you know, rotating it toward you as you moved around the lobby. So it was always facing you, except that we lose that uh, illusion when we go over the top of the head there and we realize this is actually a very shallow person. So that's basically what an image prop is. It's just a picture that you're adding. It's a three dimensional picture that's actually in the model. It's not like you're just sticking it in there, like if you were just to drop it in afterwards in Photoshop, but it is uh, has uh, room in the model, it casts shadows, it does all kinds of great stuff, it's lit by the lighting if you select that option. Um, now the auto rotate to viewer may be something that you don't want to have at times, so if I have a, a human figure standing up against a balcony or close to a wall or something or in a doorway, then having that, you know, as I move the camera around, I might have that image actually kind of twist it so that part of the, of the image prop is sticking into that balcony railing or sticking into the wall. Just like this ivy over here is not rotating around. So if you look at this little clump right here, it's staying in that same plane relative to my little wall here, nice and flat, because I don't want the ivy to be turning toward the camera and then sticking itself halfway into the wall. Now another thing that you can do too is this is a this little oleander here is um, one of the online uh, Vectorworks library objects that you can bring in here and it is using crossed planes and that means there are actually two image props going on here that are intersecting at a 90 degree angle and that works really well for things like plants. So we're looking at two image props intersecting. It looks a little odd for people you know you, when you, if, you should, if you do that um, with anything other than plants or things that are kind of you know clumpy. Um, so Let's take a look over here though at the staircase and I want to explain a little bit some of the other ways that you can use image props. So this staircase I'm using in a show coming up and it already exists. It's already been built. It was built for a different show and we're, we're reusing it. But I want it to look right. I want it to be there in all of my renderings. So what I've done is I went in and, and looking at photographs of the staircase, it has all this like hardboard cutouts on here to make it look like wrought iron, cast iron on this staircase. And I looked at the photographs of it and I drew this out in scale in Vectorworks just in 2D. And then I exported that image out to Photoshop to create a mask for it. And all this is, all these little riser details are here are image props that are stuck on here. They have the same texture that the rest of the staircase has, except that they have an image mask to make part of it transparent, just like around the edges of our human figure here, it's transparent. Um, and we can look through it. So as I orbit around, I'm seeing through that image. And this is great. I recommend that you use this trick all the time. If you're using any kind of grills or lath or lattice or anything where there's a lot of that kind of detail, it'd be really easy to create lattice. It's just, you know, you using a duplicate array, it's super fast. But when you suddenly create that many more objects, you're not really getting that much more information from it being actual dimensional, um, but you're adding a lot more to your model and a lot more to your render times. 
Now, if I, when I go to render this thing, I'm zoomed way out here. If I had actually kept my original drawing and extruded it to the quarter of an inch that this material actually is, and then made all of these duplicates on here, I would have added an enormous amount of data to my file and to my render time for very little you know, effect. So when I'm zoomed way out here, this is like, about, like how it's gonna look in my overall rendering of the whole stage. Like that tiny little bit of depth is not gonna come across at all. It's not gonna be one pixel's depth width, but it, it's gotta calculate all of that extra geometry. So using this little shortcut here to, uh, to just use the image prop to add a greater level of detail without adding all that geometry is a great idea. But what if I was building this from scratch? We were actually, I designed this and I, I was gonna have some carpenters and some metal workers actually make this thing. Well, what I would do in that case would be to save my original copy. I do the exact same trick for my renderings and maybe even for, for my you know, overall sort of isometric views of the staircase because the, the fabricators that are gonna build this are not gonna be looking at the overall height and width dimensions of this staircase to get this little detail. They're gonna look at the detail plate. So I'm just gonna take the side and the front view and that I've saved on their own class and just hidden on, turned off that class until I'm ready to create a detail viewport on the plate where I'm and giving the instructions to build the staircase. And then that one image of the actual geometry, I can snap dimension lines to and I can do section cuts or whatever I need to do to the real geometry without adding a huge amount of data to my files, either the viewports or the original model. Hopefully that makes sense. So I use that kind of trick all the time in order to get a lot more information in my models. One thing though, before we actually build one, I wanna go and walk you through the steps of creating. We'll make another person here, but I wanna show you what's actually going on on this one. Let me go back to my, my uh, final render works here just so you can see a little bit better. This little clump here is not actually an image prop. I made this one first and then I took that image and I duplicated it in the resource browser and I took that and made it a texture and applied it to these guys over here on the wall because what these actually are, are just, I took, it, took and drew a nerve surface and then I used the deform tool to bend it and then I just stuck that texture of that ivy onto the surface. And you can see it's actually these sort of three shield shapes here. So when we go back into the isometric view here, I lowered the camera down a little bit so we get some of the better effect and we'll throw those shadows back on. We get a nice little depth to it. So the, the shadows are, are casting some nice shadows onto the wall. It feels kind of clumpy. You don't even notice that it's the same image replicated three times here. I mean, if you look close, you can, but you're not gonna be doing a rendering of just this ivy. It's just gonna be in the background somewhere where it's just gonna be some kind of green clumps. But this gives it a whole lot more, same it's got kind of that roundness to it from applying it to that surface. So you don't always, you can use textures just like you use image props on other objects with those transparency um, uh, layers in there, which I think can sometimes do uh, better effects than just using a flat image prop. It's also gonna, you know, uh, r respond to the lights in a different way. You can apply bump maps, you can apply displacement maps, all kinds kinds of things to both image props and of course to your regular textures. But again, I find that, you know, I could throw a displacement map on here that would make this ivy look a little bit better close up, but you know, all that extra time turning on that displacement channel uh, in the rendering is just gonna slow your rendering down and you're not gonna get much uh, benefit at all when you're zoomed out the way that you probably are gonna be looking at this ivy. But be aware that you can use all of those other kinds of um, channels that we have in textures when you are creating uh, image props as well. So let's go ahead and do this one from scratch here just so uh, you can see the process if you've never done it. So going up here to model, you're going to find create image prop in that list. So just select the image prop. And the first thing it's going to ask you is, well, where's your image coming from? Now you can reuse an image that's already in the, the, the file see here. So here's the oleander that's over here and this image prop that I downloaded from the library. But in this case, we're going to create a new image. So we're going to go ahead and find an image. So here's a bunch of uh, figures of guys that I have in my morgue. I'm going to use blue Blue sweater guy that I've used in the past here. So I'm going to find this image. So blue, blue sweater guy is, I'm going to zoom in here a little bit so you can see him a bit, bit better. Where'd he go? Um, blue sweater guy is here, uh, is on a black background. So I just took this image, like one of these, took it into Photoshop, put him on a, on a black background, and I left the background black. So in case your mask isn't perfect, then instead of getting little white pixel highlights or the original background's color um, suddenly showing up in your rendering, it's good to leave that black background on there, I think. Um, 
Um, oftentimes I will, you know, lower the, um, the go, in, go into the gamma correction and just knock down the gamma a little bit there so that it doesn't look quite so bright um, inside of your large rendering. Sometimes the people can look strangely bright, um, just kind of knocking them down uh, with a little bit of um, a contrast or, you know, brightness contrast, that kind of thing to make them look a little bit darker uh, helps a lot. And then you go ahead and create a uh, mask layer here and save that as a separate file. So I'm going to select blue sweater guy here and say OK. And the first thing it's going to ask us is to give it a name. So it's just giving it the name of the JPEG that I'm importing. That's fine. Um, and then it's going to ask for your heights. Now, if you notice that I had that guy crop pretty closely to the top of his head and the top of his feet, and I think that's a good practice. So then you can just throw in a height of a normal person. Six foot's great. And then you don't have to worry about the width. All this is kind of like, you know, maybe you want a really tall person or you want a slightly shorter person. You can make them different. If you've got a bunch of people in your scene, you can adjust this number here. Um, and, uh, and then you're good. We're going to skip the mask options because we'll do that last. Cross planes down here is what I was talking about earlier with what's going on with this plant. That's just creating two uh, perpendicular planes of the image prop. Don't recommend that for people. Now, the consistent reflectivity is one that you really want to be careful of because that's going to make it's going to add a glow channel to the texture, which is great for TV screens, windows, anything like that, where it's like it wants to glow. Um, but you don't want to usually use that for people or plants or things because you want the lighting in your scene to light the the person not having them sort of glowing unnaturally on their own. So use that for sort of backlit stuff, computer monitors, that kind of thing, but not for people. Leaving create plugin object, which is there by default, is not a bad idea because that allows you to go back and make some edits. It leaves it as an image prop. Otherwise, if you delete that, then it just drops it in as a generic solid and it's 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 not very editable. It's, you can still do it, but it's a little trickier to do. But if you leave this in here, then you can go back and realize that, oh, I didn't actually crop uh, the top and bottom of this image and I set it to six feet, but he's actually really short because he's actually got, you know, two inches of uh, of image above his head and below his feet so he looks really short so I can change his height to uh, uh, to fix that afterwards and you can do that if you've left it as a plug-in object auto rotate to viewer is what we've been talking about in terms of having it always face the camera and of course you can also say create symbol if it's something that you think you're going to reuse again so maybe you're creating a lamp post or something that you know that you're going to use a lot of times uh, and it'll just drop it into your resource manager um, but I think we're all set here for the blue sweater guy except for the mask so let's go ahead and say use mask. Now, if you have a rectangular shape, you're putting up a painting on the wall or something that's a rectangle, you don't need to use a mask. If it is rectilinear, then no mask is required. You only need to use the mask if you want this cut, cut out silhouette. So we're going to grab the use mask and click the create mask button here. Now you can say reuse this props color. So if it is a kind of a green screen sort of picture and it's a really clear high contrast image to where it's a, a, a per person is standing in front of a background that's not anywhere in their actual body, you can use that. You can also bring in an alpha channel from a PNG or a TIFF or file formats that save an alpha channel. I find that those don't usually work as well as they should. And I think the best way to do is just to re-import re the, the, the mask. So I'm going to go back in here to my guys and I'm going to find my, where'd he go? Uh, here he is, my blue sweater guy mask. And I'm just going to say, okay. Now you can use grayscale pixels, but if there's any darkness, like this guy's got like a black tie on or something and he's got a lot of dark pixels on him, those are going to be either transparent or slightly transparent. You can, in your mask, use shades of gray to make uh, a level of opacity. Things don't have to be transparent or opaque. You can have them be translucent by using grays. And I actually don't want parts of them to be kind of ghostly, so I'm going to use transparent color. Now if I was bringing an alpha channel, I could select that here. But I'm going to use the transparent color and say OK. And then just want to make sure that the transparent color that is over here on this side is the one that I intended. So if I invert this, if I select, if I click on this picture and select the white, then what I'm going to get here is a black shape, black rectangle with a guy sized hole in the middle of it. That's not what I want. I want the background here to be the transparent part so that the white part stays opaque and the black part stays transparent. It can be any color you want, except in this case we are using the the black and white masking on there. And you can adjust the tolerance and the contrast a little bit. Sometimes that can help, um, you know, if you've, if you've got a few little spots that are not behaving themselves. But usually this is all you need to do and then say OK. 
And a lot of that work is what you're going to be doing in Photoshop or your paint program of choice. So now when I say, okay, here is the guy, and he's dropped into the scene, and you notice he is floating a little bit off of the ground, but his two feet are fairly parallel. That's something I look for when I'm looking for um, care, you know, figures to drop in. I might nudge him down a little bit so his toes are just kind of touching the, the floor, and it looks like he's staying on his tips to his tiptoes. But don't forget, he we are looking at him in the front ortho, 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 orthographic view, and as soon as we tip him, see, now, now I, I feel like i got to pull him back up a little bit because now it looks like his toe is kind of sinking into the floor. We're really going to be looking at these figures, you know, like that. Like, there he looks fine. It doesn't look like his foot is sinking into the floor. It doesn't look like his back feet are floating. Um, but you just want them to be fairly parallel. If you've got a, a guy walking f toward you or whatever, sometimes that can be a little tricky to make sure that their feet look like they're resting on the floor. But that actually looks pretty good, and he looks fairly good. And he's responding to the light. When we turn away from the light, he starts to get dark. and we turn into the light, he gets a little bit brighter. If we were to put a spotlight on him or some kind of shadow, uh, it would create that effect. We'll go and throw it into Final Quality Render Work, so we'll get the cast shadows of him on the floor, although that's not a very exciting angle for that. We'll put him over there. And um, so you see, it, it creates a great shadow. That shadow will fall onto other objects. It really looks terrific. And that's true of ivies, things on the walls, all that kind of stuff. One last thing I will recommend though, be careful with how big your image is. So this is about as close as I'm ever gonna get to this guy. So if this is a you know 500 pixel high image, that's perfectly fine. If you're bringing in a 2000 pixel high and it's 2000 pixels by, you know, I don't know, 600 pixels wide, that's way too big. And you bring in six or seven people into your image and some plants and some lampposts and all that. And suddenly you look at your file size and you think, why is my file so huge? You know, Vectorworks it puts all those things on board into the file. So we don't have a bunch of folders like other programs do that we have to reference. It's actually in the document. So if you're bringing in somebody and you decide not to use them, then delete him out of your resource manager or use the purge function um, to get rid of stuff that you don't need. And then making sure that the images, maybe the original source that you have in your on your hard drive is a 4k image because someday you may want to use it really big well make a copy and shrink it down because you really don't need anything near that uh, level of resolution when this is as close as you're going to get to it maybe even farther away maybe you're gonna be looking at like that you know why bring in a you know 4000k image when uh, it's all it's going to do is just add a whole bunch of data to your file that you're never actually going to you know, get the benefit of. Um, so be careful of how much you're bringing into your files that can really create large uh, file sizes and slower renders than you need. So hopefully that's going to allow you to use image props in some clever ways. Now you know how to add a person to your image and maybe you can use some time and labor saving ways to add lots of life and detail to your models with image props. Thanks a lot.